You can see I came with a texted talk to hold it at five minutes. That's what I was asked to do. <coughs> and um, I was asked to react to Dr. Crawford's talk and to give what Christianity has brought to the subject of bioethics. And I said, well, I haven't heard Dr. Crawford's talk yet. So I'll tell you what I wrote. Thank you, Dr. Crawford, for your eloquent presentation. Um, I can thank him because it helped my prophecy come true, as it turns out. Um, I am on the, I'm vice chairman of the board of directors of the Institute for Spirituality and Health and the faculty uh, in Houston. It's a 57-year-old organization that's truly interfaith. Our chairman's a rabbi, local community. Houston is the most culturally diverse city in the country. Not many people know that. And we basically ministered to doctors and nurses and in, in the Texas Medical Center, which is the largest medical center in the world, by we estimate four times, depending on how you measure it, four times larger than the next largest. Um, and so uh, we see this subject of bioethics daily. It's not an academic exercise. Not only can Christianity contribute to bioethics, but has contributed over the centuries, starting with Augustine in the fourth century, really coming to a large part to uh, Aquinas in the 13th century, and up until today. It, Christianity is the largest religion in the world, but it's not monolithic. Uh, it consists of over 30,000 denominations, so obviously I can't speak for all of them. I will speak about the teachings of Catholicism, which makes up the vast majority of Christians. The main Christian contribution to bioethics has been the guiding principle of the dignity of the human person. Based on Jesus' teaching, love God and love your neighbor, which actually comes down to one teaching, and that is love others as I have loved you. Both, both of these interrelated teachings are due to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we believe indwells universally in all people regardless of their religious belief. As Mother Teresa said in India, ministering to the Hindus, be the best Hindu you can be. Human dignity applies to everyone in the world regardless of religious belief or dogma. It is more than just passive nonviolence. It is proactive love. And respecting human dignity includes respecting an individual's free will and informed conscience, concepts that were introduced by Christianity. This respect leads to some very interesting conclusions. For example, when it comes to personal moral responsibility, the informed conscience trumps the dictates of all other human beings and organizations on earth. So to ask someone to violate their conscience, even if we disagree, is to ask them to be immoral. So it is morally wrong to say to, some, to say to someone that they must believe what you believe or they will be condemned to hell, since that compromises freedom of will and conscience and is presumptuous of knowing what God's will is. Hence, one doesn't have to be Christian or even theist to go to heaven. Though we are obligated to make informed conscience decisions on the morality of an act or an omission, we can never say that someone has sinned since we cannot climb inside their head and know if they have full knowledge and full freedom. The bioethical challenge to implementing these principles is summarized in the operative word informed, which is accomplished without rationalization, which in today's modern terms is sometimes called confirmation bias. This has led to other Christian contributions to bioethics, such as the double effect principle, which provides guidelines to make moral decisions when complex double effects are involved as is often the case in modern medicine. These principles are used in hospitals today, but not necessarily with awareness of their Christian origin. 
My presentation this afternoon will expand on the practical Christian contributions to bioethics based on faith and reason. The discussion will include the biological brain, free will, individual versus group conscience, consciousness to inform the conscience, and ultimately the spirit guiding us from within. Well, our next presenter is Dr. Uh, Robert uh, Hesse, who holds a bachelor's in theology from UST, uh, bachelor's in science and chemistry, and a PhD in physical chemistry from St. Louis University. Um, Dr. Hesse is vice chairman and uh, faculty at the Institute for Spirituality and Health and is the co-founder and president of Contemplative Network, an interdenominational Christian contemplative prayer organization that encourages interfaith collaboration and scientific research. Uh, his primary, primary interest include the convergence of science and religion, um, presenting a paper titled Conscious uh, and Consciousness. Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, a Christian Perspective. Please welcome Dr. Robert Hesse. Thank you. Um, there are three different ways, and I want to be sure I control this properly. There are three different ways, basically, to look at and make moral judgments. Uh, one is basically feeling. Uh, if it feels right, I do it. And uh, maybe it's the Nike ad that I recall. But uh, it, this can become very subjective and tend to go to moral relativism. And uh, if you hear somebody say, I'm spiritual but not religious, in its extreme case, that can become so subjective that love is not required. It's a matter of what I do with myself. And Catholicism has, has kind of dabbled in all of these. Um, prescriptive, which is legalistic approach, uh, and the Catholic Church put out a series of penitential books before most people could read or write because it was the Bible, had, I mean, the printing press hadn't been invented yet. And basically, that became very fundamentalistic, and uh, it, that didn't work. Basically, it gave all the conditions that possibly could happen and gave people definitive instructions what's right and what's wrong. But that really leads to fundamentalism. And I think that tends to be one of the biggest threats to us in the religious area. And that is, uh, I'm religious but not spiritual, so I don't have to love. All I gotta do is follow rules. I don't you know, go to mass on Sunday, don't eat meat on Friday, I'm set. I don't have to love that guy next door to me. So ultimately, the way this presentation is gonna go is going to be principled, basically, faith and reason. And that's what the Catholic Church it does now. And it's based on one basic, simple principle, and that is love your neighbor just as Jesus loved us. It's about as basic as you get. And um, the other principle that it's based on is non-dualism. Basically, that the physical body and the soul are interstitial, and they were meant for each other. And that the body is basically uh, studyable with science, and the spirit with faith and theology. And so they have to be consistent with each other. And so true faith and reason have to be self-consistent. If they aren't, then you've got a problem with one or, or the other or both. Now, the, the, the talk is entitled Conscience and Consciousness. And the first thing that the, the uh, early Christian church did was to turn to the Greeks. And the Greeks had a word called, called synodesis that really encompassed both of these words. Consciousness being the external self-awareness of how you exist in your environment and information that comes in. And uh, you want to have true consciousness basically on good science. If, if it's bad science, if it's an optical illusion, you're dealing with an erroneous consciousness. Conscience is the internal moral God and it's basically either sincere or insincere. And if you start to rationalize and, and not accept what your conscience is telling you, uh, you can get into what's called confirmation bias. And there's been a lot of studies, scientific studies on that, that once you have a, pre, a world view, you tend to only look at things that support that. So basically, from that main principle of love comes a fundamental principle in the Catholic faith, and that is the informed conscience. 
and the informed conscience is the holy grail. Nothing trumps the informed conscience of the individual. The Pope can tell you to do something wrong and you're morally obligated to not do it. So it is the holy grail and as a result, um, this kind of came through from the Greeks to Augustine in the fourth century to Aquinas in the 13th. And we developed one of the biggest contributions to bioethics, and that is the informed conscience and free will. And you're going to see this weave through this discussion as we go along. Um, and so as a result, that's why I could say in that statement that you don't have to be Christian or a theist to go to heaven because you have free will and you can have an informed conscience. So basically um, the, uh, did I, there are three elements to an informed conscience. Basically biological brain and you have to have that. You've got to have true information and you have to have uh, an indwelling spirit and we believe that everyone has the indwelling spirit and I'm going to go through each of these to talk about why they are all required. Each one of them is required to have an informed conscience. The first is biological and I want to introduce you to Phineas Gage. How many have ever heard of Phineas Gage? One. <laughs> Phineas Gage lived in the late 1800s. Uh, he was a church going person. Um, he never cursed. He didn't drink. He didn't womanize. And he was the one that placed the charges in the rock formations to place blasting charges in there to blast away the rock to make way for the railroad. He's holding one of the rods he used. In the late 1800s, uh, a, a uh, crowbar was actually just a straight piece of steel with a point to the end. Well, one day he drove it in and uh, this is what happened. It discharged, it ignited, and it blew it through his skull his skull was uh, exhumed about 15, 20 years ago and scanned. And what had happened was his frontal lobes were completely wiped out. Now, this is significant because after the injury, he healed because it was such a clean entry. But from that point on, he was womanizing, cursing, uh, drinking. He was, by all objective standards, very immoral. Science has pretty much determined that the seat of moral judgment is in the frontal lobes. Now, that's conscience is where that's at, basically. The story of Michael May. How many people have heard of Michael May? Down to one. Two, Michael May lost his sight at age of three at in a miraculous uh, surgery, had his sight fully restored in his mid-40s. Now, basically, Michael May once he had his sight fully restored, you would think everything would be fine. Well, in general, the senses come through the parietal lobes in the back of the head, but that's not quite true. And ultimately, what we learn from the Michael May case is something very interesting, and that is the senses that come in is re are really consciousness. We're being conscious of the outside world. And basically, we learn from Michael May that sight, or senses, is not the same as insight. Michael May couldn't distinguish between depth of field, the forest from the trees. He didn't recognize his wife's face from one day to the next. And he, objects were difficult. What we learned is that consciousness really involves the whole brain and it starts to wire itself from a very young age to fill in all of the gaps that our senses can't make sense of. So with experience, you learn that, oh gosh, when I see trees, there's probably a depth of, far, depth of field there, and your brain is pre-programmed. His wasn't. So now we go back to one other subject. So far, I've been telling you basically about individual conscience and consciousness. But there is such a thing as collective synodesis basically collective consciousness. We've heard it from doctors here that have a general opinion that smoking will cause cancer. There's a collective consciousness that that's true. Um, there's a collective conscience in, the, in religions and in a state, civil law, 
saying what's right and what's generally accepted. For example, stealing's wrong. Now, this creates a real challenge if you have a contradiction between individual informed conscience and group conscience. And I'll get into that as we go. But basically, we better pay attention to the group conscience because there are a lot of people out there that thought through these things before. We can't get too cocky. But there are other examples. Gandhi challenged the state. His individual informed conscience was able to change the state, group conscience. Martin Luther King, the same way. Now I'd like to go on to the second main issue, and that's information, how the uh, informed conscience needs not only a functioning brain, but also information. The basis of the information from the Catholic Christian standpoint is um, love God, love your neighbor, All basically the you know, love, God, love, God, love, the, love others as I have loved you. And I'm going to jump through some of these, basically. Faith and reason are both in, in needed, and moral authority comes from your religion and from natural law. Now, when you put all these together, you come up with basically a prioritized list of principles that can be applied when making moral decisions in bioethics. This actually started with the just war theory from Augustine in the fourth century and was, was worked with time. These are prioritized, and each one of these trumps all the ones below it, but not the other way around. So we have to treat people with ordinary human dignity, that is love, which means we, have to get, we can't withhold food, water, the basics. The second principle is don't intentionally kill. So you may, my mother, for example, didn't want antibiotics, and, and she was dying, and we honored her wishes because she wasn't trying to kill herself. She was merely saying that I have a choice here, and so we let her die rather than kill her. There's a difference between letting die and intentionally killing. Now, you notice if she had said withhold water or food, that would have been a different circumstance because number one, trumps two. Now, in, in this concept of, um, of these prioritized rules, there are challenges. The next prioritized rule is honor patients' wishes. Well, we did honor my mother's wishes. Uh, later, um, well, we did honor my mother's wishes, which was the right thing to do. And you can withhold treatment. You don't have to give treatment and be morally correct the fourth is minimize patient suffering. Now, we try always to do that. Uh, Catholics do not believe that suffering is the greatest thing in the world and that God does not want us to suffer and that we shouldn't put suffering on others. Uh, my father was dying. I saw that he was in suffering and pain and I told the nurse, please give him more morphine if you can without killing him. She said, okay. I talked to him a little bit later and he was very upset. He said, I, want to be, I wanted to be more conscious of my, my transition to the next life. I had actually violated this, my, my father's four, third principle by asking, I think that's the other next speaker speaking. So I actually had violated my father's wishes. And uh, so I was trying to meet uh, priority rule four, but I violated three, and so that's not right. Now, imp 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 implementing these is the challenge. Loving's easy to say, but how do you actually implement? Well, the problem with medicine is that there are double effects. You can't do one thing and not get something else happen. That's generally the case, especially when things get more compli uh, complex. So but the double effect principle uh, is a very concept that is used in hospitals and it did stem from Augustine and Aquinas to the present. Basically, the act or omission can't, can't be evil in and of itself. The, um, the intent must be good. The good can't result from the bad and good must be greater than bad. Well, 
again, these are easy to say, but you, you know, you start going through some specific cases, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge in medicine and, and it's dealt with every day in hospitals. So the question is, how, do, how are these double effects evaluated? Well, the informed conscience gets the information and basically these are some of the examples of the effects that the information coming in has to address. You have to look at what's the success of the uh, procedure, what is, what's the potential for death, expected lifespan, life quality, patient age, secondary illnesses, side effects, caregiver struggle, e economic impact. All of these have to be taken into account and the individual takes that all into account and makes their own informed conscience decision. They cannot be told that they shouldn't follow their conscience if they come to a conclusion. So what, do you, what information do you do? You go to religious teachings, sacred scripture, natural laws, civil laws, medical experts, scientific. This is not all inclusive. Basically what you're doing is you're doing your due diligence. You're saying what is the impact in this double effect? And you're allowing the person to make that judgment. So the religion will give advice Civil law will say, if you're going to be Kevorkian, we'll put you in jail. And, may, and Kevorkian may still come to an informed decision and say, well, I'm going to do it anyway, in light of the fact he knew he would go to jail. But that was his decision. Now, obviously, if you get into a situation where you're having to change civil law with your decision, you're up, you're up against a difficult struggle. Advanced directives, I'm not going to dwell on this, but obviously an informed conscience doesn't do much good unless you tell other people what you've decided. Take note of the footnote, practical. I do this with DocuBank. They keep a, dra a, a draft of all of these do relevant documents. I can call in to a hospital or a doctor in 10 minutes having 40 pages, getting around uh, HIPAA and a whole bunch of other stuff. It's very practical. Um, this affects moral culpability, this whole issue. So the act or the omission determining whether it's right or wrong is not only within our capability, but it's required that we make that decision. But we cannot judge whether the individual is fully knowledgeable or fully free. And as a result, we can never say to somebody that you have sinned. Only God can make that determination. So Mr. Chick-fil-A, when he said God is going to condemn you, well, that's not the Catholic teaching. That's one of the other 30,000 faith. Spiritual indwelling, this is critical. We believe that the spirit dwells within everyone regardless of their faith belief. How do you commune with the spirit? Prayer. The most common form is discursive or the Greek uh, name given to it is cataphatic. I practice contemplative prayer which is a form of ancient form of Christian meditation and it's without words. Discursive is with words that are either spoken or thought. Cont contemplative is without words, turning the attention and the whole focus to God. In doing so, what happens, science has shown, is that the brain has neuroplasticity and it changes. Guess where it changes? Frontal lobes. Remember Phineas. So practice of contemplative prayer is bringing us in touch with that decision and the subconscious can bring forth what the spirit wants us to do in, the, in our belief system. There are physical effects, I won't go into them, but it's back to the non-dualism approach, okay? Things happen with body and soul. And the spiritual effects are basically the, the, spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but in this particular circumstance, the wisdom is one of the ones that is absolutely useful. This is the last slide. I figured I've been through a lot of stuff and being an engineer in practice at times, I, uh, I have to have some sort of a flow diagram and I couldn't help it. Uh, if a theologian looked at it, they would take issue if, uh, you know, so don't, but basically the conscience is, is like the, that room in the house where it has no windows and the conscience says to the free will and the free will is the gatekeeper. The conscience says to the free will, I can't make a decision even though I have the Holy Spirit with me uh, I need more information. So the free will says, I'm not going to get you more information. I'm having kind of good time here. I don't need that. And so they, that you can choose evil or good. Or the free will can go to the consciousness 
the external source of standards, get the information, feed it back to the conscience and say, okay, your turn, what do I do now? The conscience says, well, you can do A or B, A is better, B is not, not as good, C is definitely bad. The free will has a choice. And guess what? If, depending on what it chooses based on the advice from the conscience, it can choose good or evil. So having said that, we have a free will, we have informed conscience, and that has to be honored by every organization and individual on earth. Whether they will not put us in jail <laughs> or whether the religion may say, well, you're kind of violating some of the basic principles here, you might want to consider another religion, that's a different story. Time? Thank you. If it's okay, I have a question for Dr. Hesse. Um, you were speaking about the kind of the non-dualist system within Christian thought uh, and the role of, of consciousness and brain and biology. Um, to what extent do you think that that implies that Catholicism, Christianity, needs to abandon the hylomorphic distinction, which is the distinction between form and matter. Um, I know that's not technically Catholic dogma, but it's applied a lot, especially when people look to Aquinas. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Abandon what? Uh, hylomorphism, hylomorphic distinction between form and matter. It's usually the soul is the form of the matter, which is the body. Um, I know Rahner has an opinion on this, and uh, just would be curious what you have to say. Well, um, I'll, I'll answer that question, but I'd like to address a couple other things that were raised, particularly since I was the only one that had his hand raised, I think, before. <clears throat> uh, after you heard my presentation, you, you observed how important informed conscience is. And uh, as a result, in the uh, individual mandate in the healthcare system, uh, the Catholic Church, its schools, its hospitals are all required to pay for uh, abortions uh, in addition um, to uh, birth control. Uh, that violates our informed conscience and as a result we believe that that's what makes it unethical. Now we, the Catholic Church is one of the main proponents of having health care available to everyone. We believe that's the just right thing to do but it's got to be done in a way that you don't violate people's informed conscience. We're not saying that a woman can't have an abortion and come to her own informed conscience. What we are saying is that we should not be required to be a participant in that by paying for it. Just as there were conscientious objectors during wartime, this is the position that over 43 institutions, including Notre Dame, and the number of hospitals that Catholics run in this country and schools is just incredible. And 43 of them band together and are filed suit against this under the First Amendment, not the, uh, the other amendment that was run through the uh, Supreme Court already. And so it's, um, it's an important issue for us. And um, uh, I can tell you that I've been to Mass in Beijing and, and uh, Hanoi. I've been to 60 different countries. And in those two locations, um, worship is limited to the church. If you go outside the church, they tolerate it in the church, but if you'd go outside the church and try to help people in your way and according to your faith, uh, you're in deep trouble. And that's kind of the way this is headed. Uh, we're being required to act against our, inf our informed conscience outside of our church walls, and it feels very similar to Vietnam and China. I've seen it there. Um, there were... Uh, um, a couple other things that were raised that I thought were worthwhile um, that um, the, the reason that we're against in vitro fertilization is because of the principled approach that I just described and that is that you have to uh, uh, have conception of a number of eggs and you only use one that's successful and the others are destroyed and so uh, we believe in a principled approach, and, and uh, those who may not agree with the Catholic Church in that regard have their own informed conscience and certainly can follow it. But uh, uh, we don't claim to know that life starts at three months instead of four. Uh, science certainly can't tell us that. And every time people have 
tried to determine that on a feeling basis rather than a principled basis, uh, say based on viability, then it becomes an issue of, oh, well, it's not viable, but it feels pain. So then the movement, the time came back, okay. Uh, a woman has a right to make this decision on her own uh, and uh, come to her own informed conscience, okay. Now, as far as form and matter is concerned, the question you asked, it's, um, that's kind of a philosophical question that uh, I think in, an, in a non-dualistic system, things are interstitial. And uh, so the, the concept of a higher state of consciousness, an altered state of consciousness, which would, is what he was talking about, is very much the same within the Catholic tradition. Um, and uh, the other thing that's rather interesting is uh, this concept of entropy. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics says that entropy always has to increase. So to say it's going to decrease is a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. Now, and by analogy, I can understand where this can be thrown out in a, an analogous way, but not a scientific way. Prignoni, one of the men that he, they put up on the slide, won a Nobel Prize for explaining why we here exist as human beings in a very organized fashion, in spite of the fact that entropy is supposed to keep increasing. And he said there are systems where you add energy and you can uh, cause uh, not entropy to decrease, but you actually live off of it almost as a parasite. So a human being, for example, very organized, but does not contribute to, uh, but continues to contribute to an increase in entropy because we eat organized food and we discharge disorganized feces. So in, we still are living by the second law of thermodynamics. And the same is true of a whirlpool. A whirlpool meets the Prignoni definition, energy put in, and there's organization farmed. But it's, it, we can't speak as Catholics in terms of tri, uh, the soul being uh, guided by the second law of thermodynamics. That applies to physical things. Okay, uh, I, I think uh, Dr. Hess is the one who mentioned uh, uh, the, the medical cost, the medical cost, the percentage of the medical cost of GDP, right? I didn't. I didn't mention that. Did, yeah. I think he did. Yeah, but oh, uh, okay. But yeah. That, that's uh, uh, may, maybe. But still, it's uh, um, you know. Uh, well, it's, a, it's re re relevant to, to you or uh, sure. yeah. 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 Oh, I'd like now, to answer that. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's still a factor in determining a double effect. I mean, you need to look at the cost. I had a, a family who were prepared to keep their mother alive indefinitely in a vegetative state. It would have bankrupt them and their children. And they were making a, a conscious decision on their part that I would not personally have agreed with. But cost has to be a factor when you're making uh, an informed conscience decision. Yeah, you wanna, uh, did you that, want to that, That's a, a point that I, I like to uh, make. The, I, I think that uh, uh, the medical cost in this country, uh, it, it, it was, at, uh, like a 16% of GDP or 18% and it'll eventually go up to uh, uh, over 20% uh, sooner or later while the uh, neighboring country like uh, Canada uh, 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 does the uh, uh, medical insurance under 10% uh, of the GDP. And I think the, uh, the, the fundamental problem is that medical industry in this country just charges too much for, for their service. And uh, uh, that, that, that means, uh, I mean, doctors make too much money. And uh, uh, I mean, the, I think there's just still, to tell you the truth, there is a lot of greed in, in this, uh, uh, in medical uh, industry. Like uh, for instance, in re recent years, uh, uh, Korea has been uh, the uh, uh, advertising that we are welcome to a foreign patient, and because of their medical standards is high, it's, uh, many uh, surgical procedure, uh, the success rate is uh, uh, higher than, than other uh, industrialized countries at the cost, uh, at the fractional cost. That's why a lot of, last year, uh, about 60,000 foreign patients uh, went 
and also th this year it'll easily hit 80,000. May, may, may we address that? I think you've made the point. I think you need to address that, and I would like yeah, to, yeah, too. That, that, that's Can right. We, so, so we, anyway, so I, I think that the morality has been practiced within the medical service industry in this country. Otherwise, this Obamacare, all this insurance, blaming insurance company, this is not going to solve the problem. The, uh, I mean, doc doctors and all the medical service people uh, shouldn't be making that much money. Uh, we have enough time for one sentence responses from our three panelists, and then we'll break. <laughs> All I can say, I, I've been a practicing surgeon for 30 years, and I haven't had a patient who said, I do not want this surgery. I didn't have to go solicit the business. Uh, I think it's a triple-edged sword. Hospital makes money by admitting patients. Doctors make money by s treating patients and patients have never said anything because they don't pay. So everybody is a winner here. To live needs to go. <laughs> Give it. You're going to finish up, okay. Uh, I work with a lot of doctors in Houston and there's a big concern on their part that they won't be able to continue. There, there's a lot of talk about worry about this whole subject. There's also no tort reform in Obamacare, which is part of the big problem that the doctors are facing because they're under a lot of pressure. So now in Texas, we have a Texas tort reform, and the result is doctors flock to Texas as they do where there is tort reform, but it's not in Obamacare. So it's not that I'm against Obamacare totally. It's just that we have to deal with these issues. Now, we can always talk about somebody being greedy, but I believe in the human spirit is generally good. You're always going to have greedy people. And so to condemn a whole group, it, just like you would condemn all Jains or all Catholics or all that, is a form of prejudice. We do it with, we do it with uh, uh, sexism, we do it with racism, and it, it exists in religionism and in ec economism. So I, I, I'll say this. When the conversation was going on, Elliot was, Elliot was here, uh, I wrote a note to show to my colleagues, and it says, high cost also due to Dr. Greed. <laughs> and, I, and I wrote that note before that conversation started. And I've also looked at the numbers tremendously. One simple fact to keep in mind, uh, when a doctor owns a own MRI or a ultrasound unit, the t number of tests that go up, two and a half times more. We know that. The other fact I, I, I want to, uh, respectfully disagree on that is the issue of malpractice. Though Texas and other states, including Tennessee, have put in caps and tort reform, the cost of health care has not gone down. And this has a lot to do, we've seen it across the nation, that cost does not go down because the bad behavior, quote unquote, if you want to call that overuse, does not change among doctors. Uh, so it's a long conversation, but I'm, I'm glad we're talking about the cost of health care in the ethical conversation. Wonderful. Let's share our appreciation for our speakers.